Okay, so now let's talk about nursing and more specifically how gender factors into the practice of nursing. Um, as just an introduction here, nurses make up the largest group of healthcare workers in the United States. In 2016, there were 2.9, almost 2.9 million nurses in the U.S. And the profession of nursing, as you read in your text for this week, is really indebted to Florence Nightingale. Um, so Florence Nightingale was an English nurse who trained with a Protestant minister in Germany. When she got back to England, she established a hospital for sick, gentle women in distressed circumstances. And she staffed that hospital with trained nurses from good families. She really wanted nursing to become a noble profession. And she, so she recruited women from upper and middle class backgrounds. But women at that time had a difficult time reconciling the duties of their jobs with the expectations of being proper ladies. So, for example, they did not want to have to look at people naked. They did not want to have to be present at, at physical examinations because they felt like that was unladylike. Um, and really before Florence Nightingale um, started her work before the 19th century, nursing was mostly informal care that was done largely by nuns. Um, also women in the family and anybody's family were expected to be able to give, um, you know, sort of informal medical care to be able to nurse somebody back to health. I mean, I think this is probably still true to this day that we think our moms have special healing powers that um, help us get better when we're feeling sick. Um, but before the 19th century, there was no training for nurses. They weren't highly regarded. Um, and Florence Nightingale really changed that. Um, so after her work with this hospital for sick gentle women in distressed conditions, um, the Crimean War breaks out in 1854. And Britain is a part of this war. And so um, Florence Nightingale organizes a group of nurses and tries to hire them out to the British military. But the British military refuse. They don't want to pay for it. So she retaliates by refusing to allow any of her nurses to provide patient care on their own. So instead, what they did was they, she said that they would only work when a doctor or physician requested them. And it turns out that this strategy worked because requests for nurses started to roll in. So the military doctors started to request the nurses. Um, and at the, as the Crimean War goes on and at the end of the Crimean War, Florence Nightingale and her nurses are really held in high regard. She's, um, they're considered angels of mercy and she's quite popular um, when she gets back to Britain. And so um, you see the Nightingale model start to dominate nursing education. Florence Nightingale described the ideal nurse as having the best attributes of a mother and of a housekeeper. She saw nurses as um, being responsible and clean and self-sacrificing and brave and cool-headed and hardworking and most importantly, in obedient to physicians. She really saw men and women playing different roles in society, and she saw nurses as being both caring and subordinate to things that we tend to think of women as being. And so her views, although she changed, she totally changed the game for nursing and, and brought it, um, her actions sort of brought it to be what it is today, started to get that ball rolling, um, they didn't really establish the view of nurses more broadly from society's point of view as having the leadership and the independence that was necessary for true professional status. So instead, um, she stayed um, pretty close to these traditional gender roles. Nursing is, as many of you I'm sure know, a heavily female-dominated occupation. I think something like 90% of nurses in the United States are women. But unlike other female-dominated jobs, like teaching, elementary school, for example, um, nursing is paired with the powerful male-dominated profession of doctor. And so how what's been of interest to sociologists is 
how doctors and nurses navigate the power dynamic where you have the doctor in a much more powerful position and a nurse in a less powerful position. So um, research from the late 60s by Stein talked about this interaction as, um, as the doctor-nurse game. And so uh, the idea of the doctor-nurse game acknowledges the fact that um, nurses sort of have to walk a fine line with doctors, and doctors to some extent do too, but for a different reason. And so nurses are able to navigate the power dynamic between them and the doctors they work with um, by sort of having these less formal interactions. And so Stein studied this and called this the nurse-doctor game. And he argues that the nurse-doctor game is a real game, that nurse-doctor interactions are like a game in the sense that they have an object. There's an object to the game, there are rules to the game, there are points associated. So the object of the game is for the nurse to show initiative and ingenuity through recommendations to the physician in a way that appears passive and totally supportive of the superiority of the doctor. The rules are, though, that in this process, there's no open disagreement. So the doctor is seeking a recommendation and the nurse is offering a recommendation, but neither one of them can appear to do so, right? So the doctor can't look as though he's asking the nurse for a recommendation because that would undermine his superiority. And the nurse can't look as though she's giving a recommendation to the doctor because that would undermine the doctor's superiority. So they both have to do these things without making it look like that's exactly what they're doing. So here's an example of how this doctor-nurse game could play out. So let's say a nurse calls a hospital staff physician who is sleeping to report on a female patient that the doctor does not know. So the nurse tells the doctor that the patient is having trouble sleeping and that um, the patient has just been informed about the death of their father. So the nurse is really telling the doctor that the patient is upset and needs a sedative to sleep. In other words, the nurse is giving a recommendation to the doctor. Because the doctor is unfamiliar with the patient, the doctor asks the nurse what sleeping medication has been helpful to the patient in the past. So here, the doctor is actually asking for a recommendation from the nurse, but doesn't phrase it that way. So instead of asking what has been helpful, it, it, the doctor is asking what has been helpful in the past instead of saying to the nurse, what do you recommend? So together they treat the patient, but both of them have followed the rules. The nurse made a recommendation without making a recommendation and the doctor asked for a recommendation without appearing to have asked for a recommendation. So they're both playing with these rules of seeking and offering recommendations, but doing so in a way that maintains the doctor's authority. And so there are points associated with the doctor-nurse game in the sense that the doctor gains respect and admiration of the nursing staff, and the nurse gains praise from the doctor. If the nurse um, behaves out of line, comes off as too bold or too brash, or just somehow sort of like not respecting the superiority of the doctor, they could be a nurse that people don't want to work with in the future. They could be shunned. If the doctor doesn't ask for recommendations, the nurses may not respect the doctor. So there are consequences for not following the rules in this way. This whole game implies that doctors are superior and that the hierarchy needs to be maintained. Nurses are playing into this game just as much as doctors are because nurses don't want to lose what status they have. So this is early to mid 20th century. So the study is in the 60s, so we can safely assume that the study is looking at this 
interaction, doctor and nurse interaction in the, in the middle of the 20th century. There was an update to this study in 1990. So Stein, Watson, Howell, right, same author, same first author, gets two colleagues in 1990 to update the research on the doctor-nurse game. And what they find is that we don't see this game playing out as much, even in the 90s. Nurses are less willing to be treated as unquestioning subordinates. Well, why is this so? You've got a diminished authority of doctors sort of more generally. You have an increasing number of women doctors, and they do not play this game. So it could be that the theory here is that because they doctors, um, female doctors, are likely to be interacting with female nurses because females dominate the nursing profession. When that happens, there isn't that same gender dynamic where the guy is in a powerful position and the woman is not. It's two women, and so that gender dynamic doesn't enter in and actually Research find the, the study found that female doctors don't play the nurse doctor game with male nurses either. Um, the, there's been a shortage of nurses that really highlights their necessity, and so um, nurses can afford to sort of not engage in this game because the doctors really need them. There's also an increasing presence of nurses in academia and nurses are getting higher levels of education, both of which give them more credibility in their field and more leverage to push back against this game of superiority of the doctors. And then you also see an increased number of male nurses who also don't play the game, again, because they're interacting with primarily male doctors, and they are not going to you know, gender socialization perhaps may um, may mean that and probably does mean that male nurses don't feel the need to be subordinate the way that women are trained to um, and socialized to a lot of the time. So uh, the other thing is that um, although we've seen these improvements, we also see some things remaining pretty static. So even though only 10% of nurses are men, we still see male doctors viewing male nurses as more competent than their female counterparts. So male doctors see male nurses as being more competent than female nurses are. There's also a gender dynamic between nurses and female doctors. Even though female doctors don't play the nurse doctor game, they're more likely than male doctors to have their questions, to have their actions questioned by nurses. So when they make a decision, um, they are more likely than male doctors to have nurses ask them, are you really sure you want to do that? In addition to these sort of things happening at the level of the social interaction, you also see male nurses are paid more money. There is a persistent gender gap in earnings for nurses, even though 90% of nurses in the United States are women. You see men earning more than women across a number of different work settings, clinical specialties, and job positions. So our cultural ideas about nursing as something that is about being a caring and clean and responsible and obedient person, if we think of these as characteristics that women should have, when men enter into those kinds of positions, they're not obligated to display those kinds of characteristics. And the characteristics that they display instead, um, like initiative and... Um, authority are rewarded by the workplace. So you say, you tend to see male nurses being paid more money than female nurses, which you can see here in this graph. Um, so what does the future of nursing look like? Well, 
you're starting to see a greater specialization of nurses. Nurses are moving into hospital administration, primary care, nurse anesthetist, right? They're practicing anesthesiology and cardiovascular specialists. This movement in particular of, of nurses into administrative roles um, allows lesser trained nurses to take on some of the basic tasks of nursing, but it also, um, it also pulls nurses away from the day-to-day -day interactions with patients, which is what the job is really about or was intended to be about. Um, you have the emergence of the nurse practitioner um, who has greater authority than a, than a sort of regular registered nurse to treat basic medical problems. Um, so they can diagnose and provide some of the same care. And as people increasingly have access to medical care through changes to healthcare legislation, clinical nurses may provide much of the primary care for patients. So you're starting to see a lot of um, uh, nurse practitioners and clinical nurses in doctor's offices. So if you go to the doctor, you may get a nurse practitioner instead of a doctor. Um, and also in these minute clinics that are popping up in places like CVS and Walgreens, um, if you were to pop in there, that would be um, probably a nurse practitioner that you would interact with. And they're licensed to prescribe medication in all 50 states. So um, one of the issues, though, with this, both with the nurse practitioner side of things and with the development of doctorate programs in nursing, is that they're starting to challenge the authority and the dominance of medical doctors. So you'll start to see the American Medical Association pushing back on these things because um, as nursing professionalizes and becomes more of a... Um, um, sort of research-based and diagnosis-based field, you're going to start to see some of um, some of those things are things that doctors do, and if other people can do them too, then you don't see the same level of medical dominance that you've seen across the 20th century. So um, that concludes the lecture on nursing. I just wanted to give you some reminders for the last two weeks of this summer term. Um, first is that your fact sheet is due at the end of this week, so Sunday, July 29th um, by midnight. And what you'll do, hopefully um, you've read the instructions for this assignment that I posted on Blackboard last weekend. Um, what I want you to do with this is I want you to um, attach your fact sheet to a discussion thread. So you'll start a discussion thread like you do every week, but instead of answering a discussion question, you are going to have a brief, like one to two sentence description of your topic, and then you're going to attach um, either the Word or the PDF version of your fact sheet. PDF is probably um, better. It's probably easier to open for people, but if you can't do that, then your Word is fine or whatever you have. Um, so you'll attach that um, to your discussion board post, and then the discussion board will operate as normal, except that when you go to respond to somebody else's post, you're going to be responding to their fact sheet. So you'll click the link to open the attachment and you'll read their fact sheet and then you'll respond um, in the discussion thread. Um, just like always, also, I expect you to be responsive to the people who are responding, who are, who are um, commenting on your thread or on your fact sheet. So keep in mind, this is a discussion board. I want to see a dialogue. Um, so if you have any questions about the mechanics of that or the particularities, just send me an email. Um, if you find that some kind of emergency is coming up, I need you to let me know ASAP what is going on. So hopefully it's smooth sailing for everybody. 
Um, but if some catastrophe has arisen, please keep me in the loop. I don't want to find out after the fact that something happened this week preventing you from finishing it and you never told me. This does not mean like if you can't, if you are like just busy and you can't get it done. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, the final exam is going to be an essay exam. Um, and it, the prompt for this essay exam will be posted. It'll go live at midnight on Saturday, August 4th, which is the end of week eight, which is the last week of the term. And you will have to turn your final exam in to Blackboard by midnight on Monday, August 6th. So basically you have all day Sunday and all day Monday to complete the exam. So that's 48 hours to complete it. Like I said, it's an essay exam. Um, the questions tend to be broad questions. So you should be prepared to incorporate something about the ecological model in there since that is something that we've talked about quite a bit throughout the term. Um, I suspect that it will probably be at least two questions because um, there's just a lot of information this term. So it would be fair to say that you might get a question about the first half of the term and a question about the second half of the term. That might be um, one way for you to prepare. And so what I would do is go back through all of the modules. On every module page, there are a list of objectives. There's, there's a description of the module and then there's a list of objectives. So it's going to tell you things like students should um, be able to talk about the um, idea of social construction of health and illness, something like that. So use those as guideposts and return to your notes, return to the lectures. Um, it's not going to be enough for you to just take a quick look through your notes, I think. I I am very, um, I am very strict about incorporating readings into your essay. So this is not like an opinion piece. This is not what do you think the answer is based on your own personal feelings. This is what did you learn in this class? And so I am looking for a lot of connection to the materials that were discussed in this class, and I'm looking for proper citation of those materials. So in my classes, essays that tend to get A grades are ones that draw on the material to illustrate the points that they are making. So while the ecological model tells us this, and we saw this in this reading and this reading and this reading, and here's how we saw it. Those are the kinds of things I want specific connections to the material. So you need to make sure that you also return to the readings and make sure that you understand the point of those readings. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email over the next two weeks as you're reviewing your material. I encourage you to start looking over it sooner rather than waiting and only having those 48 hours to look over your material. Um, and then keep in mind that I dropped the lowest quiz grade. So um, if you have if you have taken all of the quizzes and you plan to take the quiz this week, you could just not take the quiz in week eight if you wanted to. Or if you are unsatisfied with one of your quiz grades and you have yet to skip a quiz, you could take all eight and then I would drop the lowest one. Um, if you have already missed a quiz, that quiz is going to be dropped. So you have used up your sort of one freebie. Um, I think that's it in terms of reminders for the last two weeks. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, I hope that you're at least getting to enjoy some of the summer while you're taking this class. Um, but things come up, and if you need anything, just feel free to get in touch. And I will talk to you all next week.